takes off his shoe and throws it over Adam because Adam wanted to be the one that would redeem Israel. But God took it because they couldn't do it. Neither could that near kinsman that Boaz had to deal with. He could not redeem because he, he didn't have the ability to redeem Ruth. He didn't want to. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Emelech's and all that was Kilion's and Maholon's of the hand of Naomi. So he redeemed Naomi in order to get his bride. Beautiful, beautiful story. Psalm 108 identifies Edom as Israel's enemy. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph. Who will bring me into the strong city? Almost sounds like the other chapter we're reading. Who will lead me into Edom? Wilt not thou, O God, who has cast us off? And wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our host? Wow. Wilt not thou, O God, who has cast us off? This is a future event. This is when Israel was scattered. This is when the house of Judah was scattered to all the world. And now they're saying, will you not, God, come and deal with us for Adam? Who will lead me into Adam? Will not thou, O God, who has cast us off, and will not thou, O God, go forth with our host? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he is, is that shall tread down our enemies. Now, God identifies Adam as their enemies. Not only that, it also shows a future date because it speaks of Israel being cast off. They were, this is not just Israel. This is the house of Judah being cast off. Mm. Now, as we begin to look at the historical side of this, we know that Rome, the Edomites of today and throughout history, begins to, to lead a campaign, the, the, the Inquisition against the Jews, the pogroms, the forcing of conversions to Catholicism or face death. This is what they, the tortures that they did, the heinous crimes that the Catholic Church has done against the Jews is beyond, it's, 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 it's beyond understanding the evils and the atrocities that the Vatican has done to the Jews. I mean, everybody wants to blame Martin Luther because Hitler listened to Martin Luther as well, but he was a Catholic and he took his ideas from Catholicism. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. Let's set, this, let's set the record the way the record should be set. So they, they went on a campaign. Once Israel was scattered... Rome scattered them, then Rome continued right on with their ruthless campaign of killing the Jews. And you know one of the reasons why they always wanted to kill them? Remember when David took them as servants? This is one of the reasons Hitler hated the Jews so badly. Every time that the Jews would end up in a place, they would end up rising up in, in, their, in, in the status of the society they were in. And again, the Edomites were serving the Jews. And they hated the Jews because of that. That's why Hitler hated the Jews. He was an Adamite. That's why. Let me read to you Psalm 137. It's one that there's a famous song by the rivers of Babylon. It also sets history for you. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we, when we remembered Zion. The rivers of Babylon... You see, Babylon has shed the blood of the Jews until they have made it look like rivers. I want you to think as I show you this because I'm going to try to also remember to put some clips from some of the Holocaust films because then you'll understand what I mean. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, that, there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. That was Rome that carried away Israel captive. Babylon and they that wasted us required us mirth saying notice there's a difference 
The ones that carried away required a song, and the ones that wasted us required us mirth, saying, sing us a song of the songs of Zion. Remember what they did to Hitler and his regime? In the different Holocaust films, you always see the Jews playing the song. They're making them play songs. Play the songs of Zion for us. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. By the word, the word raise, in Hebrew, is spelled ein resh vav. Au. Ah is destroy. Destroy it. Ahu. Notice what it says again. I want you this to sink in for you. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. They just identified to you who said, raise it. In other words, who said, destroy it, destroy it. Even the foundation thereof. It was Rome. You can quote Josephus all you want. That man wrote what he did under the duress of the Romans. Oh, you might say he lived freely. There's coming a time soon that even I won't be able to speak the way I would like to speak without just dying for it. And I'm just, I just soon die for it then. Because I won't shut up. Now, you can take and you can call Martin Luther Edom. You can call the Protestants Edom all you want. And no doubt the ones that are joining back in the Vatican are Edom. I agree with that 100%. But when God himself right here in his own word calls the Romans Edom, you go with what God says, not what anybody else says. I don't care what rabbi says it. They got enough rabbis already. People talk about disinformation. The disinformation is the Vatican trying to cover their own tracks. They are the Romans. They are Edom, and God identifies them. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, destroy it, destroy it, even the foundation thereof. So when Josephus put in his writings that Titus didn't want to destroy the foundation, he didn't want to burn, the, 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 they said that all his men got angry because the Jews were putting up such a fight. No, sir, that's not true. God's word, God's word, it condemns Josephus in his writings. And, I'm, and, and I don't say that Josephus didn't put some historical documentation that helps, but the Romans made sure he distorted it. I promise you that. Because God's word doesn't agree with him. <sighs> o daughter of Babylon, who are, who are to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. God is going to destroy Rome for what they're doing. Let's go a little deeper here. I want you now we're going to take a little bit of a look at a look at history. This is from a book by Ernest L. Martin, and I'm just going to quote from it. It's called The People That History Forgot. I looked at some of this from online, so I don't I can't tell you the page numbers of this. But it says Mr. Martin says this here, this was only intensified at the end of the Bar Barcoba period in 135 CE with the final defeat of the Jews. The area of Judea, along with other areas continu uh, contiguous to it, were turned into a desert-type economy. People left the areas by the droves and most went north or into the west. For all practical purposes, the nationalities of the Mobanites, Ammonites, and Edomites, Edomians, ceased to be reckoned as a distinct peoples any longer in the Middle East. Their areas were, as we explained earlier, reverted into a type of desert environment and peoples from uh, peripheral lands. The desert Arabs came into these unpopulated regions. This is when Edomians and other nations around Palestine disappear from history and become part of of that group of races who blended in with the people that history forgot. 
Now, I told you earlier that I was going to take you to the historical side of this because remember Hadad, he was the one child and the servants that went with him that were the Edomites that were not killed by David and his men that were rushed off to Pharaoh of Egypt and he protected them. Later they come back, they go into Syria. We see that there, they, he becomes the king of Syria. Okay, now we're seeing what happens from that point historically. Okay, that does not end the matter, however, especially with the uh, Edomians or Edomites. This is because the Jewish authorities kept up with the migrations of their brethren, the Edomites. Edom or Esau was a twin brother to Jacob, and their descendants were, were kin to the Jews. The Jews reckoned that many of the Edomites migrated west, even into North Africa and Rome. Now, this is the book called The People That History Forgot. It's by Ernest L. Martin. To understand this matter from a Jewish point of view, a, a few historical indications have to be taken into account. It was reckoned that in early times, even before the time of David, descendants of the Edomites, or a portion of them, moved from the area south of the, uh, and east of Jerusalem into the northern coastal towns of Sidon, and then to Tyre, where they made their northern capital. Early history shows that originally the city of Tyre was formerly located on an island just off the coast and to Alexandria great, created as a causeway to it, turning the in island into a peninsula. The city of Tyre was colonized by a king with the name of Erythrus, meaning King Red, who came from an area of the Red Sea. Indeed, even the Red Sea itself, which included all of what we call in the Indian Ocean today and the Persian Gulf too, was named after this king, Erythrus, the king, this king Red, or in Hebrew, Edom, was supposed to be the first to sell rafts of the water of the Red Sea for trading purpose. For the first uh, references to, sh to him show him in the Persian Gulf, part of the Red Sea. Justin Martyr, however, in his uh, uh, gamering of early Tyr uh, Tyr Tyrian history historical events, um, sorry, Justin Martyr dialogues with uh, Trypho the 18th and said that the original Tyrians came to Tyre from the Assyrian Sea, which many actually feel was the Dead Sea. This indeed was the original territory where Edom first resided, but Edom expanded. Tra trading colonies were established on the Mediterranean coast and the Red Sea at Aqaba and the, Gulf, and the Persian Gulf. These people were the first Phoenicians, the word also meaning red, and the Roman times the name became Punic. One of the chief gods of the early Phoenicians, according to uh, Sanchantian, who was the first historian to write about them, was Osos, who clearly identified with Esau, whose other name was Edom, Red. These people were called Red after their first king, who probably uh, red-headed, not because they had red in their complexions. They established trading colonies along the North African coast in several areas of Spain, Strabo, and said in the chief city of Spain called Gades, the Holy. Isn't that interesting? The Holy. Or Cadiz today was established by the first king, Ethra, red. Um, they also built the famous Catheridge that gave rise to Hannibal, who gave the early Latins such trouble. To the Jews, they reckon that these Phoenicians, or Tyrians, were descendants of Esau, or Edom. Rashi, in his commentary, now Rashi, by the way, is a Jewish commentator from about a thousand years ago, uh, he writes, in Genesis 25, 23, states that Tyre was colonized by Esau. There is the prophetic statement by the prophet Amos, which seems to show a strong affinity between Tyre and Edom. Amos 1, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. So I want to bring that up for the historical record of it. Now, I'm already showing you clear evidence through the Bible, though, that Rome is indeed Edom. They're the Edomites of today. Uh, so we're, we'll come back to, because uh, to, uh, I'm going to get into some things with you here. In a, let, me, let me go into Jeremiah chapter 49. Also, Edom shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss 
at all the plagues thereof, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. I want to bring that out to you because we're establishing the fact that the Edomites of today are the actual Romans or in this case, Vatican, the Vatican City in Rome are the Edomites. And we can go into all other kind of facts too, as far as in the book of Revelation. It's the great whore, sits on seven hills. Uh, we, we can look at it's the, the, the number, it's the number of a man, it's a singular man. His number is 603 score and six, which is 666. Vicarious Filiadilia, which is, if you take it, it's what's over the, uh, the Pope's crown, which means instead of the Son of God. Had to bring that one out for this one right here. Instead of the sin. In other words, he claims to be Christ representation on earth. He claims to be God on earth. Like Pharaoh of Egypt, who was God on earth. Now think about it. The Edomites, Hadad escapes, goes to Egypt, grows up in the house of Pharaoh. He's God on earth. And then he comes up, becomes king of Syria, moves over along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean there. And then, you know, the, his descendant, and, and there's all kinds of different links for the Edomites to be migrating and stuff. Well, now we have Rome, and we have the Pope of Rome, who is an Edomite descendant. In fact, Pope Francis is an Italian. He's an Edomite. Now, I don't say every person that's born in Italy is an Edomite because we know that wouldn't be true. There's all kinds of people that have migrated to, to, to this area here. And, and, and again, it doesn't mean that an Edomite, if in the day that we're living now with the blood of Jesus Christ, that Christ's blood couldn't atone for him and he gets saved. But as a whole, they hate the Jews. Notice what he says though in Jeremiah 49, look, verse 18, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because notice verse 17, also Edom shall be a desolation. He's going to destroy Edom altogether. And then he likes it into Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor, and neighbor cities. Therefore saith the Lord, no man shall abide there. It's going to be a total annihilation of Edom. Neither shall a son of man dwell in. They claim to be Yeshua. They claim to be Jesus on earth. They claim to be the Christ, the Messiah. And Yeshua said, I am the Son of Man. No wonder why he says, neither shall a Son of Man dwell in it. <sighs> Jeremiah speaks of a future desolation. Is what he's speaking of. And, and you know what's, what I find interesting as well? In verse 17, everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. Plagues? Remember Revelation 11? What are the two witnesses? What do they do? These have power to shut the heaven and it rain not in the days of their prophecy, as verse 6, and have power over the waters, turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. You have to remember, Adam has spread through all the world now. Their influence is on every ocean, every sea, everywhere. They're everywhere. No wonder why rabbis were telling my friend Lori that today America is Edom. No. Edom's influence is worldwide now. This is why he has to have two witnesses. This is why, according to the biblical mandate, God has to have two witnesses before he can stone a prostitute. And he will stone the prostitute and her daughters. That's why God says, come out of her, my people. Revelation 18, 4. Speaking of plagues again, let's look at that one real fast. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For sin have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you. Double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill her to her double. See, she will reward it unto you. He's talking about the Jews and what they did to the Jews. Not only not to mention just the Jews, look what they did to the Christians. Look what they did to the early the Christians. The, you know, the Inquisition, they didn't just burn the Jews. They burned Christian women to the stake as well. That were spiritual. Uh. Okay.
We're halfway through our notes. I'm going to get into Hitler now. Now, I know that Hitler used a lot of Martin Luther's material. I'll agree with that. I understand that. And I know it's been quoted that Hitler quoted Martin Luther saying, I'm only finishing the work that you started. Let's see what Hitler actually said on April the 26th, 1933. This was cited from Richard Stigman's Gauls the Holy Reich. And this was from uh, a, um, one of the most frightening quotes in a speech given on April 26, 1933. Adolf Hitler said, The Catholic Church considered the Jews pestilent for 1,500 years, put them in ghettos, etc. I am thereby doing Christianity a great service by pushing them out of the schools and public functions. Quote, unquote. So, who was he following the lines of? The Catholic Church. I know there's a lot of debate about Pope Pius XII, and many Catholics are trying to change the truth with, uh, with a few Jewish collaborators in this regard. That, that doesn't surprise me. They call it disinformation. Oh, Pope Pius XII really loved the Vatican, I mean, loved the Jewish people and was trying to help the Jews, etc. And so they get a few Jews to come along and agree to that. Well, let me tell you something. The nation of Israel was started with the help of Rome. And they used Jewish people to do that as what see there's two forms of Zionism there's a good Zionism where the Orthodox Jews and the religious Jews that have come home to their homeland even those that are not religious but they just love Israel and they want to come home they've come home but then there's that bad Zionism the ones that would were willing to kill other Jews just to get power and control in 1948 I know that firsthand so you don't need a book to tell me that. I know that they were fighting for power because Rome wanted certain families in control of Jerusalem. And that's what they were hoping would give them all of Jerusalem once again was allowing the Jews to come in. And it's interesting that they were using the British to control the Jews and how many Jews could come in because they wanted to control what was going to happen. Now, the British, because there were certain Christian aspects to the British people that were not Catholic, had mandated a lot of land for Israel. But Rome changed all that too. Yeah. The Catholic Church was not a good church and neither was Pope Pius XII. If any Pope on his deathbed, Pope Pius XI, had a little inclination of care about what was happening to the Jews. But even that was suppressed. Let me read to you here. This is called Hitler's Pope. It's by John Corn uh, Cornwell published by Vanity Fair in October of 1999. He says here in his book, in 1930, the influential Catholic politician Heinrich Brüning, a First World War veteran, became the leader of, uh, of a brief new government coalition dominated by the majority socialists and the center party. The country was reeling from successive economic crisis against the background of the world slump and uh, rep reparation, reparations payments to the Allies. In August 1931, Br Brüning visited Pasili in the Vatican, and the two men quarreled. By the way, Pasili is the one who comes, becomes Pope Pius XII. Brunick tells in his memoirs how Pasili lectured him, the German chancellor, on how he should reach an understanding with the Nazis to form a right-wing administration in order to help achieve Reich Concordat favorable to the Vatican. When Brunig advised him not to interfere in German politics, Basile threw a tantrum. Brunig's parting shot that day was the ironic observation, chilling in, in, in hindsight, that he trusted that the Vatican would fare better at the hands of Hitler than with himself a devout Catholic. That's pretty startling. Let me read, the, this is the quote from his memoirs, from from Bruning's memoir, quote, the Vatican would fare better at the hands of Hitler than with himself a devout Catholic, close quote. Bruning was right on one score. Hitler proved to be the only chancellor prepared to grant Pasili the sort of authoritarian corticant he was seeking, but the price was to be catastrophic for the Catholic German and for German Germany as a whole. And remember, when, I, when I'm saying some of the things that I'm going to say here, 
I know for a fact, though, and we have it historically, there were some Catholic bishops that did speak against the Nazi party and what they were doing to the Jews. And if they were killed for it as well. But it was not Pasilli, not by a long shot. After Hitler came to power in January 1933, he made the concordant negotiations with Pasilli, Pasilli a priority. The negotiations proceeded over six months with constant shuttle diplomacy between the Vatican and Berlin. Hitler spent more time on this treaty than any other item of foreign diplomacy during his dictatorship. That's interesting. The Reich Concordant granted Pasilli the right to impose the new code of canon law on Catholics in Germany and promised a number of measures of favorable, uh, favorable to Catholic education, including new schools in exchange. Pasilli collaborated in withdrawal of Catholics from political and social activity. The negotiations were conducted in secret by Pasilli, Pasilli, Kaz, and Hitler's deputy chancellor, Franz von Papen, over the heads of German bishops and the faithful, over the heads of the German, excuse me, German bishops and faithful. The Catholic Church in Germany had no say in the setting, of, uh, setting the conditions. In the end, Hitler insisted that his signature on the concordant would depend on the center parties voting for the enabling act, the legislation that was to give him dictatorial powers. After the right concordant was signed, Basile declared it an unparalleled triumph for the Holy See. In an article in L'Azervatore Romano, the Vatican-controlled newspaper, he announced that the treaty indicated the total recognition and acceptance of the church's laws by the German state, but Hitler was the true victor and the Jews were the concordance first victims. On July 14, 1933, after initiating the, the treaty, the cabinet minutes recorded Hitler as saying that the concordant and created an atmosphere of confidence that would be especially significant in the struggle against international Jewry. That's incredible. He was claiming that the Catholic Church had publicly given its blessing at home and abroad to the policies of National Socialism, including its anti-Semitic stand, at the same time under terms of a concordant Catholic criticism of acts deemed political, political, political by the Nazis could now be regarded as foreign inter interference. The great German Catholic Church at the instance of Rome fell silent. In the future, all complaints against the Nazis would be channeled through Pasilli, there were some notable exceptions. For example, the sermon preached in 1933 by Cardinal Michael von Fulhaber, the Archbishop of Munich, in which he denounced the Nazis for their rejection of the Old Testament as a Jewish text. Hmm. God bless him for having that courage to stand. Now, Pope Pius XI, he was the Pope in power at the time, while uh, Pasilli was doing all these negotiations. In the summer of 1938, post Pius XI lay dying. He became belated, belatedly anxious about anti-Semitism throughout Europe. He commissioned another uh, encyclical to be written exclusively on the Jewish question. The text, which never saw the light of day, has only recently been discovered. It was written by three Jesuit scholars, but Pasilli presumably had charge of the, had charge of the project. It was so-called uh, humani generis unitis, the unity of the human race. For all its good intention and its rep repudiation of violence, violent anti-Semitism, the document is repleted with the anti-Jewishness that Pasilli had displayed in his early period in Germany. The Jews, the text claims, were responsible for their own fate. God had chosen them to make, the, uh, make way for Christ's redemption, but they denied and killed him, and now blinded by their dream of worldly gain and material success, they deserve the worldly and spiritual ruin that they had brought down upon themselves. And that's Pope Pius XI trying to do what they consider to be good on his deathbed. And Pasilli wanted to even keep that shut it up. The document warns that, that to defend the Jews as Christian principles and, uh, uh, principles and humanity, demand could involve the unacceptable risk of being ensnared by secular politics, not least an association with Bolshevism. The encyclical was delivered in the fall of 1938 to Jesuits in Rome who sat on it, to this day, we do not know why it was not completed and handed to Pope Pius uh, XI. For all its drawbacks, it was clear 
pr uh, protests against Nazis' attacks on Jews and so might have done some good. But it appears likely that the Jesuits and Pacilli, whose influence as Secretary of State of the Vatican was paramount since the Pope was... Um, since the Pope was um, um, forbund, were reluctant to inflame the Nazis by its uh, uh, publication. But silly, when he became Pope, would bury the document deep into the secret archives. Remember, this is uh, Hitler's Pope by John Cornwell. On February 10, 1939, Pius XI died at the age of 81. Pacilli, then 63, was elected Pope by the College of Cardinals in just three ballots. On March the 2nd, he was crowned on March 12th on the eve of Hitler's march into Prague. Between his election and his coronation, he held a crucial meeting with the German cardinals. Uh, keen to affirm Hitler publicly, he showed them a letter of good wishes which began, to the illustration, this is quote unquote, to the illustration, there shalt thou be delivered, there the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Israel will destroy Rome. And you know when we're going to destroy Rome? At the death of the two witnesses. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. You bring all these Muslims in here for battle? Bring them to their deaths. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves unto the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon his cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be the lowest. Now we talk about the coming of Yeshua, which is so beautiful. That you see that God has promised that Israel will destroy Rome. And that, my friend, is inevitable and will happen. One more verse here in Malachi chapter 1, the burden of the word of the Lord Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. See, Edom didn't fully get destroyed. But God said he loved Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, deceiver. And he hated Esau. So even though Israel is not a prince with God as of right now, because our eyes are not open as a whole, as our people, the remnant of Israel, he loves us. Nonetheless, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. God will destroy Adam. By the hand of the Jewish people, by the Israelites of today. God bless you, my friends. God bless you, my brothers, sisters. I'm sorry that this was so long, but I trust it was a blessing for you. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Haba Hashem Adonai. Lailatov. <laughs>